If that first drum bass DJ goes any harder, if I jump on, I'm either going to clear this room or a few people are going to just stay for support. <laughs> you got to find your, your lane and go, right, this is it. And the one thing of music is that everybody's path is different. We can all start at the same point, but my lane could take me that place over there and your can take you over there and we can still meet in the middle. I ran to the toilet, the promoter ran me to the toilet, I went, went to the toilet, come back, and literally it was a massive cheer, but yeah, we had the longest track on that. So yeah, I had, yeah. I had a few toilet break tracks, man, while I was getting used to like being on sets for long periods, man. So yeah, good times. And that's that's what I try to do with with the whole of like my releases, my brand, it's just always a competition with myself. Like there was nothing really that really tickled my fancy. And then I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it a day and revisit. And then um, where, where, where can I take this? How, you know, how, what studio, what's good studio? You know, how building a relationship with an artist. So yeah. welcome aboard to the show, mate. Thanks for coming yes. or joining. It, um, so yeah, obviously getting off the you know our previous chat just quickly, different avenues. Um, I like to research into my guests and everything, and I research that you. you Talking of like different changes in music, you actually used to be an MC back in '98. Is that right? Yeah, under right, my mentor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, my cousin, he was my DJ, and we started off in garage and kind of it was that period where garage was kind of like breaking off with grime as well. So you had like the two step stuff, then you had the half step stuff, then you had the four four as well, all mixed in. So we was kind of in sort of like limbo of what where we wanted to be because my cousin he came in when it was like house and garage. And I came in when it was two step and that was my first sort of like love. So we kind of like was working out exactly where we wanted to go. And, um, you know, we used to listen to, you know, like um, Rinse FM, like from then, like Pay As You Go, Cartel. Um, and so and so, and so many different like um, like points in Garage. And uh, yeah, MC was like the easiest point for me to get into. And, um, you know, I loved hip hop and rap and and uh, and and just the way you know, it was like writing lyrics was kind of like just my thing. And even now it's like, even though I don't MC, it's helped me a lot with doing sessions as well. So like, sometimes I feel like I can chip in and help help out in like the, the writing side of it as well, especially when, you know, there's things that I think could work as well. And, it, you know, it helps, it helps in that, in that sense now. But um, overall, that was a good entry point. Because at the same time, I was, I was making music as well. But it wasn't my strength. I feel the MC at that point was my strength. And then uh, my cousin, he he stopped he stopped DJing at that time, um, around about 2000, 2001. And um, as he changed to stop like, stop DJing, I felt myself like stop MCing as well. So it was kind of a yeah, gradual yeah. sort of like progression where I was like getting more into like sitting at home in my in my in my bedroom, my bedroom studio, and just kind of just building building beats. Mm -hmm. So that was that was kind of like where that kind of changed. So who knows if my cousin was still DJing, I probably could have ended up still MCing as well. Yeah, I mean, it, you, I mean, yeah, you could think about the what ifs, but I was quickly going to go on this as well. Is like you said, with uh, you're still writing stuff down. It's like journaling, isn't it? It's like a mental health thing, yeah. you know. It's good for like getting stuff out, and actually, it's like quite therapeutic, isn't it? Like writing stuff out, and it's still good that you're carrying that on as well. And yeah, you're never going to lose yeah, 100%. that, right? Yeah, it's good. It's good. I, I really, I really enjoy it. I really like enjoy getting into the studio and just kind of like just building something with someone and being able to just be able to go, okay, cool. What about if you switch this line to this line, or you know, and, and having that experience of from writing to jump into writing sessions with other people and being able to just add to that as well as being just like you know that it takes away from just being like a beat maker, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, you know, yeah, where yeah. you know you're just building a beat and letting the artist just do their thing. You're kind of trying to mold it and make both parties work together in a in a good way so yeah man it's good i think that's good as being a producer as well because as you're like a, a lyric a lyric i can't pronounce the word so the word off the top of my head but as you write music lyrically if you have collabs with like a, a vocalist on you kind of understand that dynamic as well by putting that them sort of two together right it's kind of thing yeah that's right that's right yeah, yeah. It, it help it helps with just like it helps speed up the process as well like sometimes mm -hmm. you get points where like um you know when you're in this when you're in a, in a session with an artist they'll sit back and you've got the track on loop and then they're they're going along and and, and finding what 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 flow and how they're going to attack the track and then 
you know, as they're building and getting points. So they might have like a four bars here. You record that and they come back and write again. Then as you're hearing the track develop, you can go, right, yeah, okay, cool. What about if you do this or add this or remove this? And, and that's the beauty of sessions, you know, just being able to just piece things together in a way that sometimes, you know, especially if the artist is open as well, like to get them to just go, okay, cool. That, that part could sound better here. And this bit could sound better here. And if we take this line away and add this line, you know, build build upon them. You know, that's that's good things. Like even working with like um, artists like Cerasi, um, and uh, I worked with an artist called Tia Talks as well. It's like building building a good enough relationship with someone in yeah. the studio to kind of like get to a point where they can trust you and you can trust them to kind of build something and and both walk away happy from that session. You know, with with a completed song or a song that's got progression. Yeah, and that, like you said at the beginning of our conversation, uh, the beauty of music obviously brings that collaboration together, right, and builds like friendships and relationships and things like that. Yeah, and it's, it's and that's why that's why I do this like podcast because you know it's just like meeting new people, hearing their like their story of how they do stuff, and yeah. I mean, so here's here's what I want to start with really then is your personal journey, like what inspirations and got you into music from like from your year, early years of your young age. Yeah. Um, the so so initially, like so, my dad he was um, he was a sound man, so he had his own sound system in South London. My uncles as well, they had their own sort of like sound system they used to run as well, and that like always being at like functions as well. So like it would be like you know house parties, gatherings, weddings, you know where every like a sound system was the integral part of like a wedding reception. Like you had to have solid set of speakers like big big sound system speakers you had to you know and 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 be playing the right tunes and obviously it's vinyl at that point as well so hearing hearing those things it's definitely like brought me to a journey where I can I can appreciate what I've listened to you know at the time I wasn't you know it wasn't like a thing of like I was into it 100% um it was part of the culture but mm -hmm. it wasn't a thing where you was like these are the songs that I really love. And like now I look back at all those songs listening to like a lot of reggae, a lot of um, dancehall. Um, and uh, we had like, it was like, it was like, a, it was called Lovers Rock. It was like, uh, it was like an R&B kind of vibe and all those kind of things. And then, then progressing into my, my team, my mid teens and finding the music that I wanted to listen to, you know, and um, you know, from garage and, and uh, you know, hip hop and stuff like that. So it, in terms of my journey, yeah, my uncle, my uncle, he had his studio and that that built me into getting into my own session, making my own, building my own setup in my, in my bedroom nice. and then building my own, my own sort of thing and then wanting to make what I want to make as well. So, you know, I'd go to his studio every Saturday. He had a studio in, in South London, in Peckham. Yeah. Um, and I would go there literally like religiously and just sit in the corner, not even press a button or nothing, just literally watch, watching what's going on. And, um, you know, even even down to when my before my first album come out, like I I was sitting in in the corner in sessions on D, with, with DJ Zinc and uh, watching him do sessions there just to kind of get an idea of what you know where 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 can I take this? How you know how what studio what's good studio etiquette? You know how's building a relationship with an artist and um you know you know those are the things that I, you know that that I you know as I got on I didn't realize that I was learning something like to bring me to this point you know where i'm like 15 16 years building something and you know doing it really yeah that's fucking that's wicked mate i i, I love the fact that you were like you know when you're young you'd like just sit in the studio not even doing anything just sitting there just like watching what's going on because you do when you when you're young right you're yeah. like what's going on kind of thing and then you know obviously you're was you, was you learning different things like eqing and mixing and things like that through that time as well um, it was more about just the beats. Like I was just yeah. intrigued in like, every, like people would just literally gather at my my, my uncle's studio. Like his friends would come around, and it, it would be like a like a like a like a get together. Everybody just come around, and and everybody's chipping in. There was like we had um, one of my uncle's friends. He would like have his own like computer where he he can do like video editing as well. And it was like there was a whole thing going on in there. It's like a whole operation, like, nice, and, yeah. that, and that that was inspiring because from a creative point, because I, I grew up like drawing and like doing art. And that was my, you know, that was my strong thing in school doing that to like finding another journey into art through music and, and being still being able to be creative and, and, you know, and uh, do what you like in a sense. And it was more of just like, yeah, just seeing what, what everybody's on. And then, you know, it was like when I started emceeing, 
then I started like recording songs and stuff. And um, that's when the studio, I, I became part of the studio in that sense of yeah, yeah. understanding the mic, understanding how to, how far to be away from the mic and build and building things from there. You know, that's, 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 you know, that's, that's like, uh, it felt like that was the foundation of what I was trying to achieve at this point, you know? Yeah, that's that's wicked, mate. I love hearing that because when you're new, you go to like a studio or something, you're really nervous. But when you've got your family around you, you feel a bit more confident to like sort of, you know, and you're going to get it. way more constructive criticism from your family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, it's been good. Like, you know, I'd say, I always say like my uncle, um, he was like a massive inspiration for why I, I did it. He was like, because he started off with his own studio and it was like, it felt like that was the start of something. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, building from that to try and figure out what the next thing is and understanding. And, you know, as you as you as you go through music and the longer you stay in it, you understand like every generation has that one bit that that pushes that can get you further and further. Yeah. You know, where the resources where my uncle was starting, it was like, you know, you was they was just on the cuff of people having to, you know, pay or hire studios out to go and have your equipment. And then from having your equipment to not even having to have equipment, having a lot of stuff in the box and being able to build something just from inside your computer to being able to like do things that the majors are able to do in independently, you know, be able to just, you know, put white labels out and, and you know, go on pirate radio and, you know, build and, and, and do all those other things, you know, to be able to push your brand, you know? Yeah, yeah. Talking about radio, you had, did you, you had your own radio series, am I right when I say that? Yeah, so I, I was on I was on Rinse FM from two thousand and nine to about two thousand and fifteen. Oh wow! Um, so I, I I left in the end because like I, the the genre I was playing UK funky I didn't really have like it got to a point where there wasn't enough and I was playing two hours two hours a week I was doing every mm -hmm. week right and I was playing like fresh stuff playing a bit of old bits as well and then it just got to a point where it was like I, I've run out of I don't want to be that person that's just playing old bits but. Obviously, in the clubs, I'll mix it up and play what I like. But on radio, you want to be as upfront as possible. You want to be playing some classics and you want to mix it up and play some of the new stuff. And I just couldn't, I didn't, I didn't have enough new stuff to play. Like, there was nothing really that really tickled my fancy. And then I was just like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to call it a day and revisit. And then, um, yeah. So, and, and from that, I, I, um, I've done two albums with Rins and two EPs as well. So it was more, it was more like a, a kind of management radio show kind of thing i had running with them and they was you know looking after my releases as well so nice. you know i was able to tour with katie b during that time um and played numerous festivals and stuff with them so it was kind of a, a big package that we'd done man and um yeah it was good honestly it was really good yeah, really that good. sounds really good time, man. man i love the fact that your family was your inspiration as well that's really cool yeah man yeah honestly I... yeah it's good and with your like your first album then, how was it like writing writing one your first track and two your first album? Like the processes of that? Like... Yeah. Um I got to a point where with my music, like I was so uh, when I was working, I, I in the evenings I would just make music. I, I like after my nine to five, I'd just go home, make music, make music. So I was just churning out these beats that that all like so my 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 inspirations like music wise, like when I was coming in was like uh, Wookie, Sticky, um, Zinc, and Zed Bias, um, stylistically in terms of the way that they kind of their music all sounded different, but they uniform wise, you could hear it was their their style. Their they had yeah. their stamp. You know, you you know you, you knew Sticky would have specific strings on his track. You knew Wookie would he would have a certain bass line and um, and the way that these keys were structured and said bias you know he had skippy drums and you know the basses warped and, and he was really creative in, in the way that he used space on tracks and zinc with a breakbeat style and stuff so my instinct was like if i'm gonna do something i want it to have some sort of feel that you know it's a rosca track whether it's the rosca tag or it's the way that i make my bass lines or the way that my, my tracks are constructed and they you know and one thing i'd say is like a lot of my tracks they kind of they're kind of fun to listen to they're not just like you know not too serious or you know and they're not they're not there's not like a crazy amount going on in there i try and keep it as simple as possible so as i was as i'm as i'm building everything up and building to where i wanted to, wanted it to be with rinse it was like every time when they would send me they they said to me send me some demos 
and I sent them, I sent them four at the time. It was, Put him, put him on blank CDs. So I pressed up like three, um, four blank CDs, forty tracks, ten on each yeah. track on each CD, and that was my demos. And they managed, we managed to get uh, an album out of that. But prior to that, literally constantly every every weekend, like or every day, like just making beats, making beats. And I felt like it was even though I was making the tracks, a lot of them didn't get released because I felt like it was in between those tr- good tracks that I released. Yeah. I felt everything was practice that I was building to try and build build my brand and build everything to a, a certain level and uh yeah my first track that i released was feline in 2008 in february 2008 and uh, that track's actually 15 years old i think this oh, wow. this month so it it for me that that track um that was like the mark that was like the start of it for me it, it felt like i i hit the ground running to a certain extent you know there was there's people at the time when the genre was quite fresh, UK funky. There are people that were looking for new music. So I was at the right time at the right place. People were finding something that was fresh that they can add to their sets. And then I think it was my my second vinyl release, uh, which was Climate Change, and it had four tracks on there. And that that one was the one that kind of made people go, "Okay, cool, this guy's serious. This is you know he's doing something." Yeah, yeah. And I felt like that one made made things a bit more solid and then when i released my third ep that's when i was you know i was i was i was catching the, the ears of rinse and you know a few other artists as well so i felt like it was just like a timeline of events where it kind of it built up and you know it's one thing that i always say to artists when you're coming in like you know it's the consistency that keeps you going if you're consistent if you're consi- consistent consistent with with what you're putting out and you continue to do it and and you build on what you've got. So each track you do, you try and better the last one you've done, you'll get somewhere. And that and that's that's what I try to do with with the whole of like my releases, my brands. It's always a competition with myself. So when I got to my first album, it was like I didn't really understand like the album format <laughs> per se. It was like more I'm gonna do an album, but it was like I think the one thing that I would take away from that album, even though that album literally it it put me in a different space altogether. Like, you know, a lot of, a lot of art, like artists that I've, I've heard of that I never ever thought I would have them play my music mm-hmm. reached out, was reaching out and, you know, um, I managed to get a nice distribution deal for like all my back catalog as well. Nice. And, uh, you know, it, it built, it built up a lot of like connections that I never thought it would do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one thing I would take away from that is like, um, a lot of the, there's a couple of tracks that are like 10 minutes long on there. <laughs> like I didn't need a 10 minute long track on there. So it was like, Loads of things like that that I would definitely like change on that whole project. But for for what it's done, I definitely believe like everything happens for a reason in that sense. You know, it doesn't matter how long the tracks are, the the way that those tracks entered into the market and whoever picked them up at that time, it definitely smashed it and made it you know a good a good entry point for me musically as well. Yeah, man, and uh, that I mean it's re- quite refreshing with what you said. I mean with quickly just off this one like the 10 minute tracks they're great toilet tracks and they yeah oh man they worked well in australia (laughs) one time i was in australia and uh (laughs) literally like uh yeah i didn't go toilet before my um set and literally i ran to the toilet the promoter ran me to the toilet went went to the toilet come back and literally a massive chair but yeah we had the longest track on man so yeah i had i had a few toilet break tracks man (laughs) while i was getting used to like being on sets for long periods man so yeah good times He's like, you got a track for it? You're like, yeah, man, I got a 10 minute one. This would do just lovely. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> so good, man. So good. <laughs> I mean, it's quite refreshing when you say um, about you're in competition with yourself because I feel like a lot of people these days now are so in competition with other people online. It's, yeah. so, it's so toxic, isn't it? Like, it's, and yeah. a lot of people are so good, you know. And that's why I like to do this as well because, like, with people like yourself, that have, you know, uh, your story might help someone else. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. Like with everyone just like comparing yourself online now, you know, and you saying I'm only in competition with myself getting better every single day of production here in that studio. That's yeah. that's such refreshing to hear in this day and age, I think. I mean, I might just be saying because of my age, <laughs> but yeah. I'm 34. But um, yeah, I mean, it is definitely, I'm glad you brought that up actually, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I feel like it's difficult in this day and age as well because I feel like the, prog- the progression from some of the artists as well, like some artists literally just rock it to the moon like instantly and yeah. there's some that literally got to churn away and chip away and like those ones that are chipping away they don't realize that you do, you've got to get to where you want to get to but you've got to put the work in mm-hmm. don't worry about what he's doing or what what she's doing and um 
you know, that's that's been the problem with, you know, a lot of artists, you know, and, and easily, you know, when you're scrolling through Instagram and, you know, this person's looking like they're smashing this rave and, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I get it. I get it. Totally yeah. get it. But yeah, you've got, you got to find, you got to find your, your lane and go, right, this is it. And the one thing of music is that everybody's path is different. We can all start at the same point, but my lane could take me that place over there and your can take you over there and we can still meet in the middle. It's just, it's just wherever your music takes you, you know, it's like throwing, I don't know, like a bit of paper or one of those bottles with the, you know, those bottles where you put a little note in and you put it on yeah. like old school, like on, yeah. on the water and it could end up anywhere. Right. You just never yeah. know. That's, that's how I treat music, you know, because when I was coming through music and doing UK funky, I thought it was going to take me over to a point where everybody was. And it took me to a point where, it took me to Japan. It took me to um, like literally all over Asia. It's, it's taken me over to America and all these places. And it's and it's not taken anybody else from that scene really, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's like you know, again, it's just that's just proven to myself that the only person I'm in competition with is me because the bench I've already I've already gone past the benchmark of what the genre was able to offer in that sense. So. Yeah, it's important. It's important to look within yourself, man, and figure out what you can change, what you can update, and what you can, what you can work on. You know, but also, yeah, there's nothing wrong with looking at your peers and seeing how they're doing and stuff, and aspiring to that, but not not taking it to a point of competition where you're actually, you know, stressing yourself out and trying to yeah, figure yeah, out yeah. if those if why you ain't getting what that person's getting. That person could have deserved that way longer than you. You never know. It's like you know. It's got to carry on and, and be and be yourself, man, and, and really like just focus and hone in, man, and and get to those points or have them on a list, man, and, and work it out how you're going to get to that point. Yeah, I'm just, I guess wicked advice because uh, yeah, it's, I think a lot of people need to hear that sort of stuff, which is really refreshing. And yeah, going off of like the ja- Japan, the Asia, Asia sort of stuff. Like, how was that when you originally got like the first invite to do a tour around like? asia and in japan how was that the uk funky sort of music like there how did they find it kind of thing like, tell me a bit about yeah, that it was story. good it was good you know i feel like um one thing that that like japan and like a- asia overall has taught me is that when you go to these when you go to these cities like there's going to be a handful of people that know you and the rest of the club might not know you at all so it's working a different skill in djing where you're able to play music that people don't know but still keep them moving and that's a challenge within itself and it only dawned on me like during like you know when we was in lockdown like that I was able to do that and I was doing that without thinking you know Mm because like you know we go to a lot we can play in a lot of clubs in like say London or your you know your usual spots and you can play tracks that are literally crowd pleasers and things that that people are going to resonate with but can you actually play music that no one actually knows, but loves the groove of them keep, and can keep dancing. And that's one thing it showed me when, you know, that I was able to do that each time I went to a different new city that, you know, I was trying to win people over in a sense of like, keep them moving, keep the club happy and keep everybody happy in the club. And um, the first time I went to Japan was uh, 2000 and, uh, 2010 and uh, Zinc was playing the day before. So mm. I was there, I managed to go to his, his event and the next day he managed to come to my my show. Nice. And uh yeah, it was a blast, man. It was so good as well, especially like going so far on your own as well. Cause that was like the first year that I was really traveling on my own to, to a lot of these shows. So to have someone there that I knew was was really good, like to you know, and build up my encouragement as well. And uh yeah, it was really good, man. I built up some good relationships with with uh, the guys over in in Japan, you know, so I was going roughly on average every 18 months to to, to Japan and playing in oh, Tokyo nice. and Osaka. And um and then I started working with the artists out there from like 2017. I started like I started realizing I'm out here a lot, you know, let's let's build something more. Let's just, you know, let's release some music and you know make it worth my while and you know make it, you know, something more than just me coming to the DJ. And um I started working with some, a crew called Trekkie Tracks and um I said to them, send me some rappers, man. Let's 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 do something completely different, like Japanese rappers on UK Funky and, and build something that, you know, do something no one's done before. And that's that's one thing I like to do with with, with my music is do, try and figure out what's not being done yet or figure out what's being done but not being done right now as well. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I've kind of, like, tried to work out. Even if it doesn't work, for me, it's like I've tried it. It's trying to 
and see and see how it works and and yeah we yeah i think we executed it pretty well man it was like one of their biggest tracks in the clubs at one point you know where, where everybody was playing that track you know a couple of times a night nice. and um yeah over here as well you know even though you know there's a language barrier it's like it still works because the the artist that was on the track she flowed so well that it's like her flow became part of the music the music was like percussion you know so mm-hmm. it was like a flow that so yeah big up Naka, her name's nakamura minami she's she's sick man and uh, yeah, the track was called Free Me. Um, but yeah, it came out 2018, I think it came out. Oh, 20, was it 2018? 2018, I went to Japan and done, and we filmed the video. And in 2020, that's when it came out, basically. So yeah, nice. really good. Nice, because I, I, yeah, I was going through your uh, your catalogue, your back catalogue of music. And uh, I um, I was like, because I always like to see if there's any music videos. And there was that yeah. pre uh, yeah one you mentioned. And yeah. Uh, I saw her in it, yeah, and she's like dancing near vending machines in in Japan yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, "That's pretty sick, man." And I thought, "That's yeah, that's, it's good that you took that sound over to there and kind of embraced like their artists as well." And said, "Come on board and like, that's yeah, sick, man, that's, that's what it's about, you know." It's, yeah. it's um, there was one um, I used to talk to um this artist called uh, Martin. He runs a label called Three Zero Two Four Three Zero Two Four. And I used to talk to him online all the time. And I don't know if you remember, he done, I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but I don't know if he remembers it. But um, I remember when um, earlier on, I mentioned about like getting into specific scenes and figuring out where I could fit in. And um, he said to me, he said to me, UK Funky is bigger than, you know, the world is bigger than UK Funky. And um, how I interpreted that was, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into, pigeonhole your genre into one scene you can make it unfold and unravel into so many okay. different places. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that that's what opened my ears to discovering and looking around outside of UK Funky to understand what parts work in UK Funky and, and who can play my sound. And, you know, and even when my first album dropped, that's when I realised that not everybody's playing a full set of UK Funky, but people are playing my music and adding it to their sets. And that was that was a massive thing for me. It was like I'm knowing that I'm able to have fans of different genres of music that are, that cover like the one two five to one three five BPM region, and they're able to slot my music into this into their sets without me having to be part of a genre. So that was that was the that was the good thing about what I was trying to build. So going to do things with like the Japanese artists and working with you know Japanese rappers and and stuff it builds something completely different and it 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 aids me to be able to do things here and and pe- another art and, and also helps them to to put out those artists to be seen in the uk in terms of people you know picking up their music and being able to you know um see see that you know other artists that are able to you know make and create this styles and this sound that everybody plays in the uk yeah yeah that's so that's so good to hear that that's that's wicked. That's a great story because I'll be honest, I've never heard anyone play in Japan before. And yeah, yeah, yeah man. That's... There's only a handful. I, I was pretty. I think I was the first. I, I'm pretty much the only one from my genre, UK funky. But there's been like a lot of garage since the garage resurgence. There's been a lot of garage um, DJs going out there at the moment. There's been, um, I think, drum and bass has been going out there for years as well. I know Zinc's been going out there, and mm-hmm. I think when I started going out there, um, that's when you sort of start starting to see more and more musicians go out there. But yeah, I genuinely think I've, if, any, if anybody can quote me differently, but I'm sure I was pretty much one of the first from like this style of this style, this style and sound that was pretty much going out there from 2010 onwards. Yeah. Either or it's a, it's a fucking great experience, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so good, man. Um, With like the uh, garage now, it is really picking back up. I mean, over here in Vancouver, the garage is, is picking up pretty big and drum and basses as well. I mean, I grew up with drum and bass, you know, I grew up in the council of state drum and bass. We had our own speaker yeah. system and yeah. you know what I mean? That sort of thing. And, and, uh, grime and rap and house music, all sorts of genres, you know, garage, yeah. things like that. And, um, so with, uh, moving, I mean, like you said, you did obviously the UK funky and you're incorporating other sort of genres in, um, I see like you've done like Boiler Room and you've done Her and you've done all this sort of stuff. And I've watched your sets yeah. and you do, like you said, you mix in different kinds of bits with UK Funky. Yeah. How did you go about like getting them sets? How was it, you know, 
how did you like yeah. plan them sets and do all that sort of stuff you know yeah i think um <laughs> like so <laughs> sorry long so with the question <laughs> no 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 so it's it's quite funny because like um so the the, the her set that i've done um i had a rough idea of what i was going to play but one thing that the uh, reason why i'm laughing is because sometimes i get to a point where i don't know what to play and i and like it's not that I get bored. I just kind of want to entertain myself as well. Cause like in between mixing this track and letting this track play and letting, I, f- I feel like I could do more. So with that one, if you check, I, I was doing three deck mixing at some point in that. So, and that, and that's like, so with that, I've kind of like tried to work out ways to transition into a couple of songs without it, like, and make it just sound exciting for me really. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I was laughing. Right? Cause it was like, I just trying to figure out how I can make this, they sound good for myself. And then like with the boiler rooms, I, I we was on I was on the, one of the early boiler rooms, man. Like when we they used to get like standard like 30,000 like views like instantly. And um we done a Roscoe and Friends. It was me, Scratcher DVA, uh MA1, T Williams when he was in a he was in a group called uh, Deep Technology All and right. Cooley G. And um, Love T. yeah, man, T's a T's a legend, man. I've had him so, on yeah, twice. Oh, wicked man! Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he's a legend, man. Yeah, so man. yeah, honestly, big up T. So it it was it was good to kind of build that and and have him on board and have and have everybody around that I was I was hanging with at that point. Um. So and uh, with that boiler room, uh, they they only had they had one CDJ. So at the time, I had the eight hundreds. So I brought one of That's the it. eight my eight hundreds with me to yeah. to use for that that setup, but. With that one, that was the first one I've done. Then I started doing stuff with Hot Flush as well. So I think I've done a couple with Hot Flush. And uh, I've done one in 2017 or 18 when I released my um, third album. So it's all, it like, I think they were just at different times and they just worked out well. I think the, the first one we did, it was really good, man. I think like, it, it helped a lot of the eyes that were on the lineup, you know, like people wanting to, like, discovering us for the first time wanting to book us and bring us bring us to their cities so it was really it was really good it was a really good entry point along with my album and all the other things that were going on around that time so doing the her set that was another hot flush takeover and um that that was good for i mean it was it's one of those things like where as time gets on things progress so there was a period where it was like right i've got to get a boiler room or right i've got to get a rinse show yeah or do you know what i mean and, and there's yeah. all these things like where I guess people like use them as like more tick box kind of things mm-hmm. where they're where they're building. So with the her set, it was kind of like it was something that I really wanted to do because I just felt like it was like an ideal thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then um I think I done um one in New York called The Lot Radio as well, which was um I done that in December. And again, that was that was a good fun thing to do as well, man. So that nice. that was good fun. Good, good fun. Nice. Yeah, oh, man. Okay. I think like there's there's some cool platforms out, man, that that really um that really care about the culture and, and have and have the you know that they really like know what you know how to tap into people man and and you know I feel like you know um with like the lot radio and even boiler and they you know there's they have the way the way that's all set up is it's kind of iconic in a way that it makes you feel like you know with the boiler room when they have everybody around decks you know, with like doing the lot radio where it's got like everybody's pictures and like stickers and stuff on the wall. It's like, you know, you, you kind of keep that trend going, you know, rinse with the rinse FM logo and you knowing all you know, you know your history and everybody, you know, the, the artists that have passed through over the years as well. So yeah, it's just a lot of things that I feel like, you know, people can be a part of, man, and build and help build their career, man, and get their voice, get their sounds all heard and, and their mixes heard as well. That's sick. I mean, how how is the boiler room like? I, I mean, I watch boiler room uh, sets all the time on YouTube. But how is it when you're actually DJing all the people around you? Because you see all these like <laughs> car crash things that people are bumping into you and stuff. Like, how is it actually in that moment when you're doing it? Well, the the first one I did was really good because um, because it was new. Everybody had that kind of level of respect. Like, I guess yes. it's the, like the distancing and kind of like. And I feel like people just so engrossed in the sound of the music, hearing something completely new. It wasn't about pleasing the crowd. It was about playing something that is fresh to someone's ears, but they have to tune in. They have to be, you know, and, and you know, you'd have people looking at the decks, looking at the track listing, listening and hearing something they've never heard before or hearing a classic they've 
they haven't heard in time, you know, and mm-hmm. and that was kind of like the feeling that you got when you done Boiler Room at that point. Um, you know, as, as as I think as I got on with like doing like some sets, it felt it feels like less of a showcase, I guess. It feels more of like you're just reintroducing yourself, I guess, in 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 a sense. Mm-hmm. But like, it depends on how you uh, where you're, w- which kind of boiler room you're playing. Like, you know, you can have like like a legendary one, like like Sherelle's one was legendary. It just yeah, had, yeah. it just went off. You know, it's one of those ones. You know, I feel like my music doesn't have that popping off kind of vibe. It has that one where it's either loads of grooves and your head down, good 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 venue, low low ceiling, dark ideal sort of like scenario for me rather than it being about everybody just going mental or whatever but it depends on how the, what the crowd's saying what how you're feeling and what how everything is around you before you can sort of decide but i feel like the ones that i've done have been really good like you know nice where it's man. just been about the sounds playing some experimental stuff stuff that people have never heard before um vips and stuff like that so yeah man that's wicked. What advice would you give for like people that are getting into G Journal, their first set, or any sort of yeah, good advice you could sort of pass over to new people as they get into it? Um I would say like the first thing I'd say is ha- have have genuine love for it. Like ha- like there's a there's a there's a lot of DJs. Like there's a lot of everybody. So it's like one thing I've learned is that those that love it will still be here for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. Honestly, it's like you you can see it. Those that really love it and want to be here, they'll be here forever till the wheels fall off. But then fast forwarding, if, if you want to become a DJ, work on your craft. What are you going to do differently to the DJ that's the DJs that's right here, right now? How are you going to engage the crowd? Same thing for your music. What are you going to do that's different? Are you going to emulate a sound or are you going to come with something that can bring a stamp onto music and have people wanting to come back to your music not because you're you know because you're making a popular genre what is it that you want people to get from what you're doing and i feel like they're the most important things out of out of, in music you know and, and one thing you know i had was i had unconditional love for music and my willingness to learn over the over the years brought me to a point where i'm here and you know i, I feel like people kind of have a love and respect that you know that anybody would want you know from music you know mm-hmm. um and it's not something that i demand it's something that you know is given when you know because of what you do and how and how much you contribute to music and i guess you know my my contribution to music shows you know what i've what i've done and what i'm able to do over the years yeah, yeah. so yeah i feel like yeah having a love for it figuring out if you're a dj producer what are you going to bring differently to what we already have right now? What is it that you can do differently? Yeah, yeah I, I agree, man. Because I think you have to find your own, your kind of your own niche and you kind of your own, like you said, your own lane and staying consistent, like what you said earlier, right? Staying consistent yeah. and just staying in that lane, and eventually, someone will just see you and be like, "Let's go," kind of thing, you know? And, yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, man. With that, over the years, and what are the lessons that you've learned that have kind of, you know, like not the lessons that you've learned to not make the mistakes again. Do you know what I mean? Cause we all need to make mistakes to learn to progress further. Yeah. So what kind of mistakes have you like? Learned um, from? So when I first started, like, um, like when I was an MC, um, I knew how to DJ because my cousin was my DJ. So mm-hmm. when my cousin was on his, on his decks, I'd mix, I'd, I would mix and I, and I, I would learn, you know, basic beat matching and build, build, build from there. When I started, so I became producer of, first before i started djing and it was the demand of djing that built me to become a dj as well and um so as as time got on i got i got to a point where i was i I wasn't as good as i could be djing i couldn't i wasn't i wasn't the best dj that i could be so the one thing i did was you know i just went back and went just got and literally got my decks and literally practiced day and night until nice. until I felt I was the best. And this was no sync days. This was no <laughs> you had to beat match, you know, and, and that 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 helped that helped me a lot. You know, it was, it was just sheer focus. And same with music production as well, you know, it was it was understanding, you know, and learning as I go along and building what I had, you know, it was 
you know, a lot of the beats that I made, the initial beats, like there was no, was no mix down. It was it literally, <laughs> it was like these beats, let them go. Like, like, yeah. And I feel like that's what's made me want to make more, uh, like just continue to release music because I don't really have that attachment to the music to the point where I don't want to let it go. Because some artists, they, they build so much music or they're building their music, but they there's so much things that's unfinished. I just know how to get to a point where I un- I finish it, and I can move on to the next thing. And and those are the those are the sort of the lessons that I learned just to keep building. And I you know I, I would I, you know I'd look back at something that people love, like out of my collection or tunes that were played constantly, and I'd look back at those and go right, that's the benchmark. That's what mm-hmm. I need to make. I need to make something that's better than this. And that and that's that's one thing. And same with my DJ sets. You know, I got to a point where I was. I was recording my sets and I was listening back to them and critiquing them. Like I'd listen to my rinse set, you know, and listen back to it and, you know, critique it, man. And, and, and then work out what I can do better. What tunes don't make sense. Take that tune out of your set, you know, add that tune in or, you know, and, and be really, really, you know, really serious on what, what make, what will make a Roscoe set, what will make a Roscoe sound like. Um, and, and I feel that that has kept me going. That has, that's what's kept my, my sound, my brand intact and, you know, able to just be able to do what i like when i when i dj and when i make music yeah that's good man because even for me i've been producing for about 14 15 years and i I took a break from it for a for a few for a few years um just for uh, family health stuff and everything and uh and uh and for moving here as well but Finishing tracks is such a hard thing because I struggle with that massively because you're such a I, I critique myself so badly that I don't finish them. Yeah, and it's good to like hear that because obviously you just like you know someone said to me the first initial like idea that you come up with is the best idea. The more you play with it, the more you just ruin it and destroy yeah, it yeah. kind of thing. You know, yeah, and of course. Um, just like playing with yeah, just like doing stuff and. I know you've got hardware as well, and that's why I like the hardware yeah. stuff because it's the initial thing coming up with that, and then just yeah, obviously yeah. just sort of molding it sound wise, and you know what I mean. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, like so, I've got um, I haven't got much hardware. I've got like um, Orbit, Emu Orbit classic, like uh, like uh, jungle and garage samples in there from like a lot of the stuff that I grew up on, and um, nice. also I've got I've got um, JV ten ten Roland. That of that um so I I borrowed I initially borrowed Team Williams one for my um fourth album, and um I was replacing some of the sounds from my fourth album using that and um yeah I fell in love with it man and I was I was like right so I'm I'm definitely gonna get one so I ended up getting a J um one for myself, and then I've got like for bass lines I've got um Dave Smith Mofo and the yellow thing up here so yeah this nice. this this is um yeah I, I use a lot of bass lines man on there like love I love that man so um. And uh, yeah, I use a lot of sounds off there, off those three mainly. But then I've got like a lot of um, like plugins as well that have like real, real sounds in there as well, like uh, native instruments stuff on there, complete, which has been like pretty much in most of my my projects, man. Like honestly, it's just yeah. like um, I started doing like sound design as well and like um, working on like movie trailers and stuff like that recently. And um, that's sick. Yeah, so like it's weird because like. You know when you flick through your sounds and you've just got these weird sounds that you're like, I'm never gonna use. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, I've started using them now. <laughs> like for me for like um like just building like adverts and like atmospheres and soundscapes and stuff like that, which has been pretty sick. So um yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 quite good. I find it fun using like like hardware and like having something on MIDI and just flicking through like loads of different sounds till you find that right sound, man. And and having that different warmth as well, it's like just got a different like feel to it, man. That that um you don't really get with like using like so like soft synths and um and uh yeah, just general like everything anything that's inside the box, man. That's cool. And so you make you got music for like movies and stuff, and so you you trying to go down that route now, like yeah, yeah, and, man. And what's that? Yeah, yeah, I feel like I feel like um where there's so much going on everywhere. I feel like, like I've done I've like so. I calculated last year that I released over four hundred songs, <laughs> and uh, I've done like that's that's four albums. That's about fifty EPs, I think. Wow! And and um, probably about hundred remixes and like a load of singles and stuff. So 
when I look at that, it's like that's that's a lot of music. So it's like, okay, what else can I do? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I, I can continue releasing music. I'm not going to stop. But what else can I do that makes sense? What, what else can I like really like jump in and do and and, and put myself to? So that that's been one thing that I've been I've been working on recently. That's been quite fun. Um, and uh, and just uh, also I want to get into like doing music production for other artists as well which has been quite cool so like nice. um, writing loads of demos and stuff for people to use and stuff like that so it's just other aspects of music that that we can explore we don't have to all go down the DJ producer route and, and be out there you know throwing your hands up behind the decks like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know we could we could do other things and, and, that, and that's I think that's the beautiful advantage of being being uh, a producer first you know you, you don't you know it's, it's not always about DJing it's, you know it's about the other things that you can add on to that as well and then you know but you become a full package you can do anything in that in that yeah and this that kind of goes back to what you said at the start you know you um about pigeonholing like it, even just with genres but even with just with music like there's so many different avenues to music and like you said with your your journey you know it can take you anywhere and you pick up something else within that sort of thing right? yeah and, exactly and, and exactly. I think a lot of people just are so focused on like one thing and I think you know let it flow and kind of just let the art yeah thing, man right? let let your music travel and let and see where mm. it takes you man you never you never know where it takes you never know whose hands it's going to be in you know uh, I've had some huge DJs play my music and I, I never ever thought they would even play my music in that in that sense you know and um you know say it's, it's when you're able to get to that point where you can you know your music's traveling further than you are and people are picking it up because that dj's playing it or that person's playing it or it featured on this you know you know you're doing a good thing man because it's touching so many different people from different walks of life man that yeah. you never ever thought you would hit that's like that's like <laughs> in 2014 roger sanchez played my track and i was like oh my yeah. god i got my missus i was like Fucking you know i was going nuts <laughs> and yeah it, it, it might have been a not a big thing for other people but for me that was a big thing you know like it's massive yeah it's yeah, big it's you know? big it's big you know you know i had I had um you know crookers at the time uh diplo um nice. you know all these artists around that period like you know benga scream like you know playing my music and i'm like yo i used to, i listen to your music i've got your music in my ipod at the time Do you know what i mean like to go from that to like them playing your music is it's a big deal man it's because you know, when you when you're a DJ and you're out, you 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 acknowledge how much music DJs get sent. You know, like I get hundreds of tunes sent, and this is getting through them all is is a lot. You know, so for someone yeah. to pick your track out, you know, it's, you know, it shows it shows that you know you've got something in there that people can you know pick out and really really add into their set and add value to their set. But that's what it's about, you know. You know, the yeah, music. Definitely. You know, when especially when you're playing out, you want to add value to your set. You want to you want to make your set the best set possible you don't want to just go out there and play any tune you know so that that addition to their set is, is something that you know you should never be taken for granted they're showcasing your music you know nice, man. yeah it, yeah it's yeah it's it's it just shows it as well like you say it's uh the hard work and the consistency it's rewarding yeah. after all that right like you say you could be working for for 10 years on your music and then boom someone yeah. finds it and you're yeah. just like thank god that's paid off but then someone can skyrocket like everyone's journey is different like you said right yeah, um, sorry, go on, sorry, go on. No, that's no, I'm, I'm good. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what kind of door do you use then? Like, what's your software and your studio setup like on the computer? Yeah, so I started on PC and um, I was started on FL Fruity Loops, um, FL Studio, and then it, it and then it then um, as I started doing sessions, so when I when I signed with Rinse, I started doing like sessions, like proper sessions. So, um, I got myself a MacBook and I started using Logic, Logic 9 at the time and then moved to Logic 10. And then, um, and then, but I was still in between FL Studio as well. And then, what would happen is what happened. Um, ImageLine, who makes FL Studio, they they made a Mac version. So they, as they made a Mac version, the license that I had for my FL Studio worked with um, the Mac version as well. So I, I slowly started moving everything over to, from my my PC to my Mac. Mm-hmm. Um, so it made it a little bit more stable. I was able to use quite a lot of the plugins that I bought as well. And uh, yeah, it just made everything that a little bit more easier, man. Um, so yeah, I'm back. I'm I'm still I'm still on FL Studio. Um, I st- and then I use I use Logic Ten just to uh, record vocals and and just do small things. So I might I might mix, I might master in there and here and there. So it just depends on how I'm feeling. But yeah, overall, yeah, FL Studio all the way, man. Yeah, that's old school. I've been using Reason since Reason Three. 
Wow. Yeah. My... I, I used it a few times, redrama yeah. and all, all those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My mate Sam, um, back when uh, we were younger, he was he went to he went to college to study music and he learned reason. He's a drum bass DJ. Um, yeah, producer. He, he he didn't really DJ much that much, but he was massive producer. Like I wouldn't say massive as in popular, but he was massively into it, uh, yeah. producing drum bass. But um, I was about sixteen at the time, and we go around there just smoke and you know drink beer and stuff. And yeah, and uh, he was just like. Uh, I'm making music now. Do you want to, do you want to, I'm learning it at school. I'm about 17, actually, 18. He's like, do you, want to learn, do you want to learn it? I was like, yeah, man, like, show us how you do it. And I looked at it and I was like, what the hell is this? And he's like <laughs> pulling all the wires out and stuff and yeah. you know, rewiring stuff. And uh, and I, I, I've stuck with it ever since. But um, it's just like you say with Fruity Loops, that's been around for a long time as well, isn't it? Yeah. Like, for a hell of a long time. Yeah, it has. Like, uh, one thing I like about fruit is like now it's, it's so much more advanced than what it was before. It was there's so little you could do on the on the uh, on the first versions. I think I've got like number six, seven, and eight. I think I was on in it at that time, and then moved to twelve, and now I'm on like twenty twenty one. I think it is. And um, honestly, yeah, there's so much you can do now. It's just crazy, man. The amount, the amount, it, and it's, it's it makes it makes music production so much more easier. But there's still a lot you have to do musically, like to to get your music sounding good but yeah overall like, i just i just love the sound that it brings and the the way that it has like a i think it's got like a weird sort of like built in like compression that it kind of like when you bounce off it just has a natural compression in there man just mm. yeah it just has a really good sound in there man really raw as well depending on how you how you push it man i was gonna also i want to pick your i want to pick your brains with um social media stuff because Obviously, back when I, you and I were doing it, that Facebook was just coming in in 2007, I think it was. But before that, I was like you. I had the CD pack and all the CDs written down, yeah. blowing it all scratch, and you skip. And, you know, yeah, it's all USBs and even even more advanced than that now. Um, like with regards to social media, how do you navigate social media now with uh, your brand and your music and stuff? You know to. Um... So keep up. It's, you... it's weird like I, I kind of don't really tweet that much anymore I used mm -hmm. to tweet a lot and uh, I think my strongest one's Instagram at the moment uh, my Facebook's hacked my, my Facebook got hacked so I haven't got that anymore so oh. like um, yeah I tried to get it back from Meta and they just yeah like their support is just crazy like I proved everything to them and they yeah it's just another story anyway but we've um, so I use TikTok and um, and uh, Instagram mainly but I've I've also started using my mailing list more as well, just to kind of like, just off the back of having no no Facebook, I thought, you know, it's proven to me that, you know, if any of these, you know, these big like corporations decide to shut up shop, then what are you going to do, you know? So I, I, I started building back up my, my mailing list and started using that more. But for Instagram, it, it's a weird one because it's hard to say your track is out now. and But then you think about it and then go, if someone says out now to you on a track, are you going to click on their bio and, and go and grab that track at that moment in time? And the answer is no, but no one does it. So it's quite a hard thing to do. So I feel like you've got to find your own way to kind of like grab engagement. I feel like I get a lot of engagement on my Instagram stories because I mix it up with um, posting, you know, reposting anything that people share with me, like whether they've got, they play my tune out or they've seen me play and they've tagged me in the post or, you know, I might share things like um, uh, interviews, releases, whatever, and have the link in there. Um, so I kind of like try and mix it up and, um, and have fun with it. At the moment, I'm just, I've been um, recreating um, um, like, uh, but I've been finding like people have been sending them to me as well. So like, I'll send a meme and then um i'll like if it's like a funny sound in there i would use that sound and make a song out of it or and oh, then nice. just kind of like repost it yeah so that's been quite funny for the last few weeks so now I've, I've pretty much got like one a week coming out which is quite fun so the next one's coming out tomorrow but beyond that like um it's hard man and honestly there's there's thousands of people like millions of djs from all across the world like trying to tell you the same message and um to the average person that goes on Instagram, it's, it's quite a lot to take in. So I, yeah. I, I don't really have a, like a straight answer for you. Honestly, it's like, yeah, yeah. like everybody's trying to like send their, you know, it's like, imagine sitting at home and then like, 
like every hour a Jehovah's Witness comes to knock on your door to tell you about like the message. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Like you're gonna be like not interested, not interested until you find something that or like if it's like different people coming to your door, you're gonna find something that interests you, or maybe you're not interested in anything, or you just want to follow and see what's happening. It's it's a lot, it is a lot to take in. So but I I, I don't know if I've got an answer, but like overall, it's just trying to find how to engage with those that do actually engage back, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's going off the back of that, then how do you see the future of like the uh, you know electronic music scene, you know, with AI and stuff, and uh, you know, and social media, and a lot of DJs coming in now. How do you see the scene moving forward? Um, I, f- I feel like you can see it now, where I feel like it's not become about the art any not anymore. Like it is about the art, but I feel like it's more about how much of an impact you can make. So. You know, it's you know where you've got like we've gone we've come into the age of viral moments like where you know for the last few years we've had it's been about viral moments from like you know uh you know whether it's been someone that's like done something that's just meme based but that's actually been signed as a record yeah and now we've got to the point where we've got personalities people showing their personality online that has become more bigger than what they're doing which has been able to make them be big in whatever they want so yeah if you're cool at something and you've done something cool if you want to be a dj you can be a dj because you can bring the you can bring the footfall into the club yeah i found that so i fit and then when you add ai onto it like even now where people are using tools to lift acapellas off tracks to put them on other tracks to edit to play out as either dj tools or as a big part of their set then you got a question how much of an impact will a normal producer have in the scene in years to come and and will it be as simple as someone just going make a tune like roscas please <laughs> and then they've compiled a tune and they've got a rosca tune yeah you know so you know and and that's and, and you, you know you, i was talking to someone about this the other day and thinking well if we get to that point then what are we gonna like what does a person that loves music and wants to create do because you've already done it, it's, it's out there. You now, what does yeah. an artist do? You yeah. know, what does someone that draws and paints do? You know, if they can, someone can just go, yeah, just shut this into AI. I want a picture that looks like this with this and these colors. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I've never really thought about it, but re- recently I've been like, yeah, what, what is the future of it all? Like, you know, and I, I always like to ask people's opinions and just be like, yeah, you know, like, I was like fucking, yeah. you're right, you could just do that, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and I'm just like, ah, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's is it going to do well? Is it not? I think I, things like AI are good for mastering and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. doing the lights for shows, you know, is you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I do want to go back actually on to like, um, the the turntables and the decks that you had. Like when you said yeah. about that 800. Yeah. I, my first pair, I had uh, Stanton decks before. Yeah. And then I went <laughs> on to the CDJ 100s with the DJ 300, the, the yep. silvers, right? And they had like Jet yep. Wow and yeah, it was like yep, yep. easy as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got the 800s. They were classics, man. Oh. Yeah. yeah. They were just like the ones below the thousands. They were like the entry point, that entry yeah. point. Like if you couldn't afford the thousands, you would get you get the 800s, man. And like they were they were good decks, man. I loved them to oh, this, I loved man. them, yeah. Honestly. Said, I said to my mate when I was, I, I took him to like a house party and uh, my cousin had the one, uh, the Mark 1s, I had the Mark 2s. Yeah. And I was like, mate, I can put an MP3 CD in this for 40 tracks, not te- not like 10. There like, you go. What? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Then I, got, I bought this it? for a paperweight, which is a CDJ 200. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. That's Sick. Classic. And then. Uh, yeah, that's wicked, man. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that I just got so that heavy. there, yeah. So heavy, yeah, I went, and, man. I went and bought it off a guy. He's like, Are you getting into DJ? And I was like, Nah, it's just a display piece, <laughs> yeah, sick, <laughs> yeah, that's wicked, man. Yeah, Pioneer made some good decks, man. Honestly, they, they, they've they done well, solid decks, man. Yeah. I borrowed the um, I, I um, so I was talking to the guys over here, at Pioneer, and they they loaned me um, the uh, 3000 setup, man. And man, that is crazy, man, wild, isn't honestly. it? Honestly. Like the the things you can do on there, I was just like they gave me a tutorial on them, and like you can literally queue up the next song that 
after the song you're playing on there. There's so much stuff you can do, man. It's just like, yeah, like uh, what they're trying to do is like eliminate you having like to use your your laptop to do like to set set the music up. But obviously, there's limitations to it. But honestly, it's just the cra- it's crazy how far like technology's gone. Where you literally can walk in with an SD card, or literally like I carry I carry like a a one two eight terabyte. Well, what's it? A two it's a two terabyte. I've got two terabyte oh, wow. uh, hard drive plugged in and away i'm gone do you know yeah so yeah. yeah it's good what um what kind of, what is what event or what uh gig that you've played has stood out to you the most that's made the most impact on you you, you thought like wow this has been an absolute insane party kind of thing or just something that hasn't gone right maybe you know like equipment always goes down it's happened to me yeah. in the past you like, oh shit like deck didn't work etc cetera, etc cetera. like yeah, what yeah. sort of experiences have you had like that I'll give, I'll give you three. So the first one I played was my, it was my, I think it wasn't my first festival. No, it was my first festival I played. So I played Sonar in Barcelona. And uh, that was the first time I played in front of 8,000 people. Wow. And uh, yeah, I was crapping it, man. Honestly, I just didn't know what to expect. Like I saw the crowd and I was just like, damn, like this is a lot. But it was good because I was with um, Marianne Hobbs and, um, and uh, Joy Orbison as well, so it was kind of nice. like it was, I was in I was in the hands of good people. And uh, after I finished, like I record, got I got the set recorded, and I I got them pressed up to CD, and um, literally just I, I think I got about five hundred done, and we just I carry a few to every show and just give them out. And um, honestly, that that was just like a wow factor for me because beginning of that year I was working, like I was working a full time job, and then I went from full like full time music. So literally like playing in front of 8,000 people. And uh, that was that was absolutely insane. Um, another one I did, um, so I was using Serato. So I'd have my laptop with me, Serato box, LinkedIn. And I, I played this warehouse. I didn't actually play in the end because we couldn't get the wires. Basically, imagine going behind. I mean, I don't know how your wires are set up in your studio, but... After a while, for some reason, it's like your wires just decide to just like <laughs> like get yeah. clumped together. So yeah. behind the decks, all the wires were clumped together. We couldn't work out where everything was, and uh, yeah, I couldn't get my Serato to work. So in the end, next DJ jumped on. I didn't play. I got paid. I got this massive bottle of whatever I was drinking at the time um, as as part of my rider. I went home, and uh, I was like, I've got to change this, man. I can't be using Serato. I've got to use cds man so i moved so I, and then as as i was transitioning i got i, I got to move over to i'm um, using um uh, usbs because that's when the 2000s were coming in into circulation so every club was getting 2000s in so i was either using cds or 2000s then i got to a point where it's boom like 2000s and then um the third one was um so last night i played at um like this brewery and um you know i think i mentioned to you earlier it's like it's one of those things like you never know how sometimes you get to, you get to a club and you just never know what the, the vibe's going to be like. And mm-hmm. I've been around long enough to know, to feel how things are going to be. So like as an example, I'm playing between, between two drum and bass DJs. And my first instinct is if that first drum and bass DJ goes any harder, if I jump on, I'm either going to clear this room or a few people are going to just stay for support. <laughs> but like, <laughs> Lo and behold, it was the opposite because I said to the sound engineer, I said, I said to him, like, you know, uh, look, is this going to be all right? You know, I'm playing like 30 BPM slower than what this guy's playing, 40 BPM. And he's like, no, 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 it'd be all right. Don't worry. You'd be good. And lo and behold, I was good. So it was, it was one of those things of like, you know, playing somewhere that you haven't played before. You don't know the crowd. You don't know how it's going to be. But it turns out all right based on, the experiences of what you've been through and how you've how you've played and how you you know and me mentioning being going to japan or going to like any part of asia and only like literally a 10 percent of the club knowing who you are and you've got to basically keep the 10 percent happy and the 90 percent happy and engaged and, and without even knowing if your if your sound is you know how your sound is you know they don't know they're blind leading you they're just coming to hear you and you've got to pick up on that yeah yeah no, I um, <laughs> I, I I like you know for me like one of the, the 
I actually went to um this is a this is a schoolboy era, but I actually went to an event where I took one USB and it didn't work and someone lent me their USB and I'm like, hell, I don't know what music's on here. So yeah. like I'm going through the music as one's playing so i'm like yeah. fast forwarding for it i'm like okay that sounds all right and then you know yeah. trying to go off that and i'm like i'm gonna clear the room like what the fuck's <laughs> gonna happen like it was it, it wasn't a car crash but it was like yeah i it didn't want to play the guys like, lead in, it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so, that's mental man that's yeah, mental I'm, yeah I'm that, listen, and I'm luckily that's never happened i've always said like that i carry like when i go to clubs i carry I've got a hard, one hard drive with everything on there and I've got two backup USBs. And what I do is I'll 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 um I'll update the, the hard drive, I'll update one USB and I'll keep one USB the same. So I'd always do that just to make sure like if I do update or anything updates, there's no there's no room for any error. And I also got a USB on my key as well. So I literally I've got so much just Don't in case, everywhere. man. <laughs> yeah honestly you just never know man you never know when they need a dj no. one time i went to a love box in uh, east london um festival yeah. and uh i was just there to watch i was literally just there chilling no no reason to play like whatever and then the, the one of the one of the organizers comes to me and goes have you got your usb and i was what he goes <laughs> one of the djs in LA, can you jump on i was like i haven't got nothing he goes oh, don't worry about it so ever since then i've always had my usb on my keys <laughs> <laughs> Legend, yeah. just in case man you never know you never you know never know because you can go to you can go to an event now and say has anyone got usb and pretty much the whole crowd will go i've got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah right exactly yeah. it's like it's gone from lighters to having a usb now isn't it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man how's um uh let's say with uh your future plans what have you got planned for the future what's what's looking on the horizon for yourself um at the moment um i'm just working out sort of like my next single so i've kind of like ventured into doing uk funky and uk garage as well now so i've kind of like like i've kind of just spread myself to a point where i just want to do what i like and what i enjoy rather mm -hmm. than like sticking to one thing so at the moment um i just released um an ep called foundation foundation ep and that's got um a legendary um garage mc called um troublesome oh, um, so sure. i've got that that's out now um and then i've got some more bits that i've just been working on over the last few like few years that i've just been tidying up um I've, i mixed down um some music uh for this artist called moon um from um from um, south korea and um i've been venturing more into like kind of doing a few more behind the scenes stuff as well that's um that's been quite entertaining and keeping me in my studio as, as long as i can man so yeah there's just been a batch of things that i've been just kind of really like um sort of like working on but music wise I'm, I'm i might do another album next year i'm not too sure um but singles wise i'll probably have something out i've kind of got to a point where i like i might get up tomorrow and go right this is the one that we're gonna push out and, and figure right. out figure everything out from there so but as for the label so like rks um i've got um uh, murder he wrote um who i released music from all the time he's he's got a he's got a um, project coming out um this month in march um also um working with a few other guys got spd got my brother ktm that i've been working on releases with as well so i've just been working with a handful of people and just helping them through because with my label it's not just like a release um it's not just like we just release music we kind of like help the artists out as well so we give the artists a bit of advice and just kind of help and guidance and stuff and, nice, and just kind of like help them with their their career as well you know the things that i pretty much didn't get when I was coming through the help that I didn't, I had to research, you know, it's kind of like open door for those guys. They can always come and ask me any questions. That's nice, man. That's really nice here to do that as well. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really refreshing because I feel like everyone like, jumps to YouTube and it's the same generic thing. But when you, when you're giving it to someone individually, that's, that's you're giving them advice to their sound and you know, their, their own sort of lane, which is really nice yeah, to do sort of thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wicked. It, what about um? I know you mentioned art earlier because I you, you're a big fan of art then. Not really. It's more like I used to just draw. There, I there was a period I just I used to draw a lot, man. I, I, and I used to, I I really I really liked. I think I just like overall art, like just creativity. Yeah, but I couldn't yeah. say I really like art art history and stuff, but um, but it's not something I don't just I don't like. If you know what I mean, it's more like yeah, yeah. I don't really I don't really it's not really my sort of like corner anymore but 
Yeah, I used to draw a lot, man. I used to draw like I used to draw people. I used to draw like everything, man. But my one thing is that I'm I'm actually I'm actually color deficient. I'm not color blind. I'm color deficient. Right. So okay. I actually I actually get mixed up with a lot of colors. Oh, so okay. if you was to ask me to mix colors together to get a certain color, I probably wouldn't be able to do it properly. Oh, so right. I can see all colors, but yeah. I can't distinguish colors like hundred percent. Gotcha. So. So I could do portraits, but I could do everything. But it more 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 than likely, it'd be all like pencil portraits, like of literally, but it wouldn't be coloured. <laughs> oh, so, oh, gotcha! I've never heard of that actually. But the yeah, reason why yeah. I bring up art is because I I've had a, a guy. I don't know if you know him, Junior Tomlin. No, no. Um, he's uh he used to do des- well. He still does actually, but he used to, he's the, the one of the main men, uh, and another artist called Pez. Uh, he used to design all the flyers and vinyl covers for all the records, all the club nights, events, brands, you name it. And he used to yeah. airbrush them back in the early 90s. He used to ride around London to all the clubs and be like, I'll design your flyers for you. Really? And he used to airbrush them. Yeah. And um, and then he's, he's, some, of his, some of his art is like one of the most iconic like art pieces of like for flyers. Because flyers now yeah. are, are worth so much money. People are using them, like selling them as actual art pieces now which used to be yeah. under people's wind wipers back yeah, in the 90s um but yeah so I, I like to bring this up because i think he's super talented he's been around since yeah the late 80s and um yeah he, like, he does all the yeah just all the designs for iconic flyers for events he's he's probably been one of the main ones behind them so he's Sick. yeah i've done a, i've done an interview with him um and uh, yeah, he's got a book out of loads of art. That's why when you said it about art, I thought I'd bring that up because I thought I didn't know yeah, if he was yeah, into that sure. sort of I'll thing. Che- right? I'll, check his, I'll check his podcast out for sure, man. Yeah, yeah he's, he's an interesting guy. Story, man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, T. Williams, yeah, I've had him on twice, actually. I love T. He's, uh, I met him actually um, at a festival here in Bank- in, in BC, Canada um, called Base Coast. Yeah, yeah, I played there a few years ago. Yeah. You played there a few years ago, yeah. Yeah, was it Base Coast I played? No, 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 it wasn't. It was Shambhala. Shambhala. Oh, Shambhala, yeah. Yeah, I played Shambhala. I haven't played Base Coast yet, no. Oh, I want to okay, play yeah. that. I was trying to get on this one, but um, seems like there's there's a, there's a lot of artists trying to get... That's what I'm saying. It's like there's so many artists trying to get on everything at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, well, I'll, put, yeah but... I'll put a word in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why Hopefully not? That, man? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, T, T was wicked, man. He's... Because yeah, um, I, I, I just messaged him. I was like, hey, man, like... Do you want to come on? And he was like, yeah, man, let's do it. And we did it. And then uh, the second time around, he was like, hey, man, do you want to, I said, do you want to come on again? And he approached me. He's like, oh, do you want to do another podcast? I was like, yeah, if you want yes. to. He's like, yeah. And we just got beers in just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it, it's so good, man. Yeah, it's man. good to see. Yeah, yeah man. That'd be, that's wicked. I'd, 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 we'd have to do a live one, like one where, I'm, where I come down to the studio when I'm in town, man, because I'll be back over more this year. Hopefully I've been doing a few... Um, I've been doing it. Well, I've I've got my visa now for America, so I've, I've literally been just um traveling to and from. So I'm not that far away, so I can I'm sure I can come over and do a few bits, man. So yeah, man, I'm, for sure. Like even let me know because I for 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 me it's cheaper to fly down to the states. Oh really? Yeah, I can drive over the border and fly over. Oh I've, sick! Anyway, flying within America is so cheap. It's it's crazy. Yeah. So like yeah, I'm good. I'm happy to like if you're about playing in Seattle, I'll be like, yeah, just hit me up and I'll come and watch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, let's do that, man. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. And I'll be back in August as well. I, I, I like to get when I when I come back, I like to get my pie and mash and I like to get my fry ups and all my fixes when I come back, right? And I like to Yeah, you've got to get them in, man. Do the touristy stuff when I come back. So <laughs> yeah. um but no mate, I honestly I appreciate you giving me your time. I mean, I don't yeah. expect anyone's time. I appreciate you coming no, no. on. Um, I think you've done amazing over the years. I mean, I, how did you find my podcast? Because you started following me. I was like, Jesus Christ. You're, uh, you know, what's this following Yeah, I like? think it's from, it's from T. Williams. I think it's yeah. from T. Williams, yeah. I was just like, yeah, this is sick. Like, I, I just, yeah, I just I just kind of discovered it through T. So I was just like, yeah, this is this is sick, man. Because I like, I like, I like inter- interesting things, man. There's a few, like, podcasts that I like, I like to listen to and, like, um, and it's always good to see people that like, are doing something that's like a little bit different as well. Like mm-hmm. it's not like, you know, your conventional, you know, podcast and it feels, you know, this is cool, man. I do like it. So yeah, man, I no, big up yourself, man. No, I appreciate so, yeah. it, man. I, I really do appreciate it. It's real kind of you to say that. Cause uh, yeah, you know, like with, with, um, I don't get much time and uh, you know, I did this cause I'm a geek with music and like hardware and producing and, 
you know, I've been DJing since I was a kid. Like my dad got me into, you know, the minute you used to get the Ministry of Sound CDs and the Drum and Bass yeah. Arena CDs. Ronnie yeah. Size was like a big thing when I was a kid, right? And yeah, yeah. a brown paper bag was a banging tune back in the day. Yeah, um, you know, and, and it's just, you know, I used to listen to, like I say, Zinc and Hype and uh, Dylan Jar and all these sort of people back in the day when I was a kid. Yeah. Tong was a big thing and and uh, just a massive geek for music. And that's why I like, I like I'll do it really because I'd love to just fucking, like your story is amazing. Like what you've achieved over the years is like, absolutely fantastic. Like, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man, like hats off to you and respect for you for doing that because, yeah, it's it's. The amount of years, like four over four, is it four hundred releases? Yeah, about four hundred, four hundred, yeah, four hundred tracks oh, over. Man. Yeah, the space of fifteen years, man. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. How long can you knock out a track now? <laughs> um, it depends, man. Like, so I've been doing the meme stuff that takes me about twenty minutes per track. Um, yeah. but like, um, I, I got like I, I challenge myself. So I, I set myself a challenge of making making a beat, making a melody and stuff, and then finishing the like getting a track to a finished state so like it's like playable um and and uh so i, I, I could roughly do like a a track within an hour i reckon like like wow. sounding sounding good like and pretty much close to mastered as well so nice. it's, not, it's not too bad yeah that's good man takes me a month yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's it man it's whatever it takes you I, I i feel like out of those tracks though even though like if i could if i build like two or three in a day i feel like maybe only one of them is really like a good one and then i might have to revisit the other ones or or scrap them but i don't really delete them i'll just kind of leave them there just in case there could be an idea for something else but overall i just try and challenge myself so i don't get to a point where i don't get too stuck because sometimes you, you you can you can hit a wall you can hit a brick wall when you're making music you go right and then you go what can i do next so that's the time to just go right save that start another one let me get another idea running and then yeah. keep going and keep going until you find something that you know that is gold man so yeah nice man uh, again I, I i appreciate your time um yeah. i hope you've enjoyed this anyway i hope you've enjoyed like, yeah. doing the podcast and nice appreciate it man